Um, and now to our closing keynote speaker, who is no stranger to our screens, particularly this year. With her signature bright pink hair, Dr. Susie Wiles is one of the country's most recognized and respected scientists. Susie studied medical microbiology at the University of Edinburgh, UK, and completed her PhD in microbiology at Oxford and Napier University, Edinburgh. She then spent her postdoctoral years at the Imperial College in London, developing bluminescent derivatives of various infectious organisms. I hope I've said that right. Susie heads up the Bioluminescent Superbugs Lab in the University of Auckland, where she and her team make nasty bacteria glow in the dark to understand how microbes can make us sick and to find new medicines. Uh, I am sure you are all as thrilled as I am to get the opportunity to hear firsthand from Dr. Susie Wiles. So I'll hand over to Peter Doherty, the Chief Customer Officer of Fidelity Life, our sponsor for this closing keynote session. Welcome, Peter. Uh, thanks and good morning. Um, I've, uh, I've got the pleasure of welcoming Susie Wiles to the FSC Generations Conference. Uh, Susie is the head of the University of Auckland's awesome sounding bioluminescent superbugs lab. Uh, and as we've heard, she works to advance the understanding of microbial infections such as food poisoning, TB and superbugs. In 2013, she won the Prime Minister's Prize for Science Media Communication. And in 2018, she was named as a finalist for the New Zealander of the Year for her work on antibiotic resistant superbugs and infectious diseases. Susie is passionate about demystifying science for the general public, and she can be seen and heard regularly in the media, raising awareness of New Zealand's high rate of infectious diseases. As you'd expect, she's an advocate of data-based decision-making, and she's not afraid to call out anti-vaxxers and others who might spread misinformation at the expense of public health and well-being. In times of crisis, we often turn to experts to help us understand what's happening and how to get through. Susie has played a key role doing just that during the COVID-19 pandemic. Today, Susie will share her inspiring story with us, uh, a little bit about what we've learned through the pandemic so far, and most importantly, how we can apply those learnings to help us solve other defining issues of our time. Welcome, Susie. Uh, kia ora. So, um, yes, thank you very much for uh, the very kind uh, words <laughs> uh, and introduction. Um, and thank you very much for the organisers uh, to inviting me, uh, for inviting me to speak here. Um, so I guess I'll very quickly um, introduce my lab in cartoon form. So this is us. Um, so, yes, I'm the head of the Bioluminescent Superbugs Lab. And as you heard, that means that we basically make nasty bacteria glow in the dark, which is not something when I was a kid that I ever thought you could actually make a job out of. But there you go. Who knows what the future holds, I guess. Um, so we have quite a lot of things that, uh, that, that we do, but the main... Um, two projects that I'm just going to really touch on quite briefly are uh, essentially drug discovery um, and understanding infection. So the first project that we have going on is an antibiotic discovery project. So um, essentially uh, beyond the pandemic there are other problems with infectious diseases um, and one of those is basically um, antibiotic resistance. So the fact that our drugs are essentially becoming useless. And so uh, in my lab we're trying to find some new ones um, from uh, New Zealand fungi uh, and basically our glowing bacteria help us to do that. So they only glow when they're alive, uh, and when, we, when they stop glowing, we can tell that they've really quickly um, become uh, being killed. And so we're basically using that to try and find potential new drugs. Uh, but the other thing that we can do is our, with our glowing bacteria is we can also see where they are. So um, one of the things uh, that we're doing is to use this to try and understand what makes bacteria infectious. So what you can see here on this slide is uh, basically mouse poo. Um, and where you can see the bits of blue, that is mouse poo completely covered uh, in a bacteria that essentially causes food poisoning. Um, and so we can see that bacteria inside of animals uh, just using quite fancy cameras. These animals are all just asleep uh, and we can basically see that light traveling through their flesh and skin and we can pick it up on our cameras. So this gives us a, a much more humane way of doing experiments, but it's also been a really good way for us to study basically uh, how... Um, various microbes cause disease, how they, how they transmit. This is one of the big things that I'm really interested in, is transmission of infection. 
Um, and so this is one uh, experiment or a group of experiments where we're trying to actually understand how do microbes change just naturally, how does that, um, what affects that change? Uh, do they become more infectious, more deadly? These are the kinds of questions we're asking in my lab. Uh, but we focus on bacteria rather than viruses. Um, but as you've heard, uh, I also have a real passion for communicating science. Uh, I take this as a responsibility as a scientist who, uh, you know, gets donations from the public, who is paid um, by the taxpayer, uh, who gets grants from government. Uh, it's my job to let you know what I do with that money. And so I uh, will often be heard talking about things, um, especially when there are kind of microbiology stories in the news. Uh, but it's not just um, being on TV. I'm also the science commentator for uh, Radio New Zealand's um, 90 Noon show, so I get to choose any science stories that I think are interesting and talk about science every few weeks. Um, and I've also uh, done quite a lot of writing, including writing a short book about um, infectious diseases and this uh, issue of antibiotic resistance. So, uh, oh, and then I've also um, done some work with animators, so i uh, made some short animations about uh, glowing creatures and the, and the link of um, that light to science. This is a picture showing uh, basically how NASA used the um, reaction that fireflies use, fireflies use to make light to search for extraterrestrial life. So I'm always, I'm kind of interested in more than just microbes, I'm interested in all sorts of science. Uh, and then a few years ago, I had the absolute pleasure of working with my daughter uh, to make a short show about uh, microbiology for kids. So we uh, did all sorts of things I probably shouldn't mention. Oh, well, well, one of them was making cheese from the bacteria between our toes. So that might just give you some indication of the kind of things that we got up to. <laughs> um, but that was absolutely great fun. Um, she might be a little bit more embarrassed of it now that she's a teenager. But anyway... Um, and then the pandemic arrived. <laughs> so I've essentially, uh, you know, I have this um, kind of part of my life that is uh, my lab and my interest in infectious diseases and our research, and then this part of me that's been interested in communicating science. So when the pandemic arrived, I did what I often do when there's a microbiology story in the news, and that's basically turn up when journalists start asking me questions to try and explain what we know, and in this case, what we really didn't know and what we needed to find out. So that started back in uh, January, um, just trying to keep up with what was happening with this um, pandemic. Uh, I then started writing quite extensively for the spin-off. Um, I like this because it gives me a little bit more room <laughs> to, to put in some of the nuance and some of the things that we're there, you know, thinking about, um, trying to point to papers and studies that are coming out. Um, and through that, uh, that work ended up working with an amazing cartoonist called Toby Morris, um, who I've admired for a long time. And we've started making graphics of some of the things that are really important things that I think that not just New Zealanders, but the world need to know about this pandemic. Um, you might have seen our graphics. The first one we did was an adaptation of a, of a graphic we saw, um, which introduced this idea of flattening the curve. So the idea being that uh, this, um, well, any infectious disease uh, will basically spread through um, a community or a population. Uh, and when something like that happens very fast and it's something that um, people end up in hospital with, it can very quickly um, overwhelm your uh, your your hospital services, uh, your ability to look after not just sick people with COVID, but sick, pe sick people with other things. Um, and so the idea with flatten the curve was basically to show that through our actions, we could slow the, the, this infection down um, and try and make sure that our hospitals weren't overwhelmed. Uh, you might have even seen the Prime Minister show this picture at one of her press conferences. Basically, this went completely viral. I guess is the word, uh, and, um, and everybody started talking about this. I'm going to explain in a minute why that was the wrong thing to be talking about, um, but Toby and I then started doing lots of other graphics together, um, including this one that you might have seen, which was to basically show, um, so this is essentially um, showing transmissions chains, showing how um, every dot is a person that infects somebody else, and showing how our actions can mean that we are not involved in a transmission chain, how we can stop this um, this virus. This ended up being uh, ad adapted um, all around the world. We've seen it pop up in India, in Scotland, in Australia, um, even on the side of uh, bus displays on uh, in Germany. So it's kind of, they've gone uh, all over the world, which has been kind of an amazing experience. Um, and if you're interested, we have covered everything from uh, contact tracing, from genome sequencing, um, all sorts of things. We've done how do you make a vaccine. Uh, and so everything is available on the web um, under our bumper uh, box set. 
um, and which we add to uh, all the time. So that's kind of what I've been getting up to during the pandemic. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit today about, about, I guess, to explain why this is happening now. Um, what's different about this pandemic to previous pandemics that the world has experienced. So I'll just sort of go through these um, a little bit quickly. So over the last, uh, I guess, 20 years, we've had four quite big ones that, that um, I guess, have been quite disruptive, but not nearly in the way that this one has. So you might remember back to 2002 when SARS emerged. So SARS is a, a, the, a respiratory um, disease, just like uh, or similar to COVID-19. It's for the viruses from the same family of viruses. But um, in the end, uh, SARS actually only um, resulted in about 8,000 cases and about 800 deaths. And one of the reasons that, were, that happened was because um, it was quite easy to stop transmission of this virus. So again, this was something like COVID-19 where we didn't have treatments or vaccines, but um, people who were infected had a very, very characteristically high fever in uh, early infection. And so that's why during that time, if you're old enough, you might remember when traveling, there were lots of um, uh, uh, infrared cameras to look at people's temperature because if people had a fever, they could basically be identified and isolated, and then you could stop transmission from that person. And so this is how we stop that without essentially drugs and vaccines. And once you stop human to human transmission, uh, it basically went away. Uh, the next one we had was um, H1N1. Uh, so this was a strain of flu um, that uh, looked quite frightening at the beginning, um, emerged in 2009. Uh, but the important thing, and lots of people say, well, you know, this pandemic happened and we didn't do lockdowns and things. I think the important thing to remember is that influenza is a very different kind of virus. Um, it's one that we see every year. Uh, and the, it, and it's, it's very different to the one that causes COVID-19. Um, and actually, this strain, in the end, turned out to have about the same kind of death rate as normal seasonal flus do. So it was a little bit different in that it impacted on um, not just on older people, but on younger people too. Uh, but because it's flu, um, it's something we know how to make vaccines for. Um, this, is, this is a virus that mutates very fast and changes. Uh, so um, as soon as this new strain w uh, emerged, basically work started on a vaccine. Uh, and essentially that was rolled out quite quickly um, once, uh, once it was identified. So it was a, a virus that we know about um, that doesn't spread quite in the same way as COVID-19, that doesn't have the same death rate as COVID-19, and that we could very quickly get a, um, a vaccine out uh, and used. And then it went away. Uh, Ebola was the next one, 2014. Um, so this is a very different virus. It's not respiratory, um, but it's uh, only spread through people who have symptoms and you need very close contact with someone who's infected uh, to pick it up. And the reason, so at the time this was, uh, I don't know if you remember this, this was quite scary. We, uh, we were worried about this moving around the world. And one of the reasons it didn't is because Ebola um, is a virus that has been uh, found predominantly in Africa, and it was in a part of Africa that doesn't have, um, or certainly at that time, didn't have huge links to the rest of the world. So it was um, quite devastating in that um, region of Africa, but didn't spread much outside of that region. And again, once human-to-human um, -human transmission was stopped, the outbreak was stopped. What's interesting about Ebola is that there, um, for a long time, it's, it's been um, thought that somebody could potentially use it as a bioweapon. So there were lots of countries that were already working on vaccines, and these were essentially just stored in the freezer. Uh, and when this outbreak happened, um, those, uh, those candidate vaccines were brought out of the freezer, um, and quite quickly, uh, trials started. And now, at the end, uh, by the end of the outbreak, which it wasn't the vaccines that stopped the outbreak, it was stopping human transmission, but we now have um, several vaccines that look quite good for, um, for potential future outbreaks. Uh, and then the last one, you might have remembered this pandemic, um, Zika virus. So Zika um, is very different to the other ones. It's not respiratory. Um, this one is spread through mosquitoes. And for most people, actually, they ha it has um, very little impact on them. Some people will have a bit of a fever. Most people won't ever have noticed that they had it. Some people do, though, um, develop neurological um, uh, symptoms some months after they've had an infection. Uh, but the reason that actually we, um, 
the reason that Zika became a pandemic was because it uh, basically moved from the Pacific to uh, Brazil at a time of the year uh, um, when Brazil had had massive amounts of rainfall and it had a big boom in mosquitoes. Um, it happened to infect a species of mosquito that um, has a different uh, life cycle and made it more likely that it would spread this virus. Um, and, the, and the main, I guess, the main side effect of having an infection was if you're infected during early pregnancy, um, it has an impact on the, on the growing brain of, of the baby. And so uh, this is how it was kind of noticed that this was not a, a great virus to be infected with. Um, but you'll see now that it's essentially gone. So it, it sort of rampaged around. And one of the ways it was brought under control was by uh, getting rid of mosquitoes. Um, at the same time, people were looking at vaccines, and so there are now are also some candidate vaccines for that. So these are all quite different, um, and basically I want to show you why kind of COVID-19 uh, has done what it's done. So what we have experienced, or are experiencing, is a virus that causes a huge number of symptoms which look like everything else. Some of the people who are infected can have almost no symptoms at all, um, others uh, end up with a severe infection. Um, and so it's been very difficult, unlike SARS, where you, know, you could say, do you have a fever? We will isolate you. This was very, very um, different. Lots of people didn't have a fever. Um, some people didn't notice. Some people thought it was their hay fever. Some people thought it was their asthma. Um, so this makes it very difficult to identify um, patients. And is one of the reasons why it's really important if you have any of these symptoms that you come forward in case it is COVID-19. And so around the world, we've been doing really great with testing, but there are countries that really haven't even been testing people unless they ended up in hospital. It emerged in a part of the world at a time of the year when lots of people were moving around. Oh, and what I should also say is that unlike some of the other viruses that I've talked about, um, people are infectious before they develop symptoms. And so this, again, makes spread of that virus really, really easy. Um, as I said, it emerged in a part of the world with a large population where everybody was spreading. So um, at that time of year, that was a way where uh, the virus very quickly moved around the world because people were infectious before they realized it. Uh, and it does this, um, the way it, uh, infections spread um, are in these what we call super spreading events, which is when we have clusters that are basically um, when people do things like um, are indoors in large groups, uh, singing, shouting, talking, giving lectures, <laughs> um, but, but lots of things uh, like being in events, weddings, funerals, um, all of these kinds of things can end up being where if one person is there and infected and doesn't realize it, you can end up with hundreds of cases or even potentially thousands of cases depending on what kind of event it is. So again, quite different to the other, um, other viruses. Uh, and lots of people are focused on, the, um, on how deadly it is. I guess the important thing to say is that um, basically it depends by age. So it is more deadly as you get older, but there are still younger people who die. But there are lots of, uh, lots of other conditions that put people at risk. So if you have diabetes, um, various underlying health conditions, if you're a man or a smoker, um, all of these um, are likely to mean that you have a more difficult time than others. But doctors are getting much better now at treating this. There are um, some old treatments that are helping. You know, people are understanding now how to manage patients. So it, the death rate we expect will lower. But that doesn't mean that people still won't have to be in hospital, um, you know, uh, being treated. Uh, so when we look at, for New Zealand, when we look at the numbers of people who are likely vulnerable to have a really bad um, experience with COVID-19, it's probably about one in four of us. But what we've seen play out around the world is that um, the, this, uh, the, it doesn't affect communities in the same way. So it is exas exacerbating uh, you know, underlying inequality um, in society where we see some, um, some groups really badly affected compared to others. Uh, and when we, we look, when we take into account, again, how many people, uh, what our age structure is, how many people have diabetes and those sorts of things, we think that if it came through New Zealand, um, it would probably result in about 1% of our population dying, which is a huge number of people, um, you know, our friends and family um, that we would lose to this virus. Okay, the other thing, though, is it's not just about death. So one of the things that really concerned me when this virus first appeared um, were what were the potential long-term health effects for people who get infected. We've got lots of um, you know, evidence from other viruses that uh, you know, 
once you've had one infection, that doesn't mean that um, you know, you're, you're kind of off scot-free if you survived. Um, and there's now growing evidence that those people who do survive, um, even if they've had a mild infection, might have damage to their heart or all sorts of other, uh, other complications. So what we don't want, again, is for all, lots of people to get infected, um, and then we may well end up with a, a real crisis in 5, 10, 15, 20 years' time as those people age and that damage becomes apparent. What we're also learning, though, are, are these um, long haulers who are people who, uh, you know, have the infection, who essentially recover, but then actually end up having, um, or clear the virus at least, but then end up having really serious um, uh, symptoms kind of on and off for potentially months. And these are things like, you know, breathing difficulties, um, kind of people describe it as a bit of a brain fog where, you know, you don't, you know, you find it difficult to um, concentrate. And obviously these all then impact on that person's quality of life. Okay, so when this pandemic first started, we talked a lot about this idea of, uh, you know, what will happen uh, is if we allow the virus to come through, it could um, overwhelm health systems. Uh, and so that led to this idea of flattening the curve. But what we did here in New Zealand was basically to aim for this elimination strategy, which is essentially to stop the spread completely. Um, it's uh, a kind of it was a great strategy for us. It meant, you know, having a really strong collective response to everybody doing their bit to stopping the virus. For us, it's about now stopping uh, any cases that come in through our border. One of the things, though, that uh, so when this message started, started being passed around in kind of February, March time, was it's very clear if you're going to do these, uh, you know, try and stop the spread and go for elimination, that if you take your foot off the brake too soon, you can end up with cases coming back. And so this is why you see it's like a short term response, you end up with cases. And actually, what we're seeing now as uh, the Northern Hemisphere heads into winter is precisely this. Um, and for some places, it's looking even worse than the first time around. So I just want to show you a little bit about what happened to us here in New Zealand um, and compare us with Australia. So this here is uh, basically our cases. Uh, it's a graph showing time with cases per day. Uh, and essentially what you can see in our first, in our outbreak, um, when we uh, very quickly went into uh, restrictions to try and stop the spread of the virus and at the same time ramp up all of our other um, cap capabilities, we got up to about 80 cases a day. Uh, we controlled it, and then we had this um, second little outbreak in Auckland, which obviously got Auckland to alert level three. Um, but because we did that really fast, went into restrictions, you know, we peaked at probably about 20 cases a day um, and got rid of the virus again. So I want you to compare that to what's just happened in Australia. So the first little blip that you can see, that is the same size as our blip. That was about 80 to 90 cases a day was where, was where they peaked, it's very similar to us. Uh, but then, um, essentially, they had spread um, later on uh, in the state of Victoria, and it took them about five weeks to go under the kind of restrictions that Auckland went into in three days. And what happened with that is they ended up with thousands and thousands of infections being in restrictions for much longer. They ended up with a, a sort of a peak of about 800 cases a day. Um, so you can see that if you don't act fast enough uh, and you allow the virus to spread, you can end up um, with a very different outcome to what happened um, to us. So the lessons learned, these are kind of my lessons. Uh, this is a great um, graphic that you might have seen sharing on social media. Um, it introduces the concept of the Swiss cheese uh, as a way of um, basically, uh, essentially what you do is you layer up what we call interventions, knowing that every one of those um, may have slight flaws in it that can, in this case, allow virus to come um, through. So these are things like contact tracing, testing, um, uh, managed isolation and quarantine, wearing masks, hand washing. Everything we do is a slice of Swiss cheese that has potentially small holes in it where things the virus can um, sneak through. But if you layer them up, uh, you can basically um, prevent the kinds of uh, things, um, the kinds of outbreaks that are happening around the world. It's one reason my plea for everybody in New Zealand right now, uh, if you are not using contact tracing app and not regularly washing your hands and not using a mask, uh, in confined spaces, you are basically not doing the cheese and we need you to do the cheese because we cannot just rely on managed isolation as being the one thing that protects us, right? That's why we layer all these things up. Even though we're at alert level one, this is how we stay at alert level one. The other thing I want to talk to you about a little bit is uh, what we call the disease triangle. So um, 
basically, when uh, in terms of infectious diseases, there are essentially three players um, uh, that influence how uh, an outbreak or an infection um, progresses. So we have the microbe itself, in this case, the virus that causes COVID-19. We have people, and so depending on what's different about us or our environment or our jobs, um, we could be exposed to the virus differently or react differently. And then we have the environment, which is basically uh, kind of where we are. And what we're seeing here with this pandemic is, you know, we're all infected with this, essentially the same virus, but it's playing out really differently around the world. And that's because the environment seems to be the most important part. So that's um, kind of geopolitical, uh, it's socioeconomic. These are the kinds of things that mean New Zealand is, is in a very different place to other countries because we've responded differently not necessarily based on the virus, but based on our values, based on um, all sorts of other things, based on that environment. Um, and the last thing I want to talk to you about really is that, um, so the thing that now that is the most dangerous thing to us uh, is the spread of misinformation and disinformation. So disinformation is basically false information that people are spreading to further their agenda. And we are seeing huge amounts of this happening at the moment. Information that's coming from overseas, information that's been created here. Um, and what this is trying to do is basically um, disrupt our collective um, goodwill, which is what has got us to the stage that we're at. As the pandemic continues around the world, this to us now is our most dangerous uh, threat, is the fact that people might get tired, they might be hearing uh, information from overseas um, and that's not relevant to New Zealand um, and this can uh, basically disrupt um, our ability to respond to future short outbreaks. Um, and so all that brings to me to really is that it is the end of an era. I think we absolutely need to be thinking about this. Um, the previous, uh, no, there is no going back to our lives from 2019. Uh, it has changed forever. Um, and so what we need to think about is how do we move forward from that? What are, the, you know, what are the things that we can do that will make us more resilient to threats in the future? Because these threats uh, will come. There will be more pandemics. You know, we know that climate change is a huge um, issue, and so we need to be more resilient to those things. And the one thing I think we have learned from this pandemic is that we can make really just drastic change very, very quickly. So I think there's no excuse now for saying, oh, it's too hard to do that. We've shown actually that we can do what's needed, uh, even though it is difficult. Um, and so with that, I will uh, kind of thank you for your attention. And I believe we might be going for a Q&A chat. <laughs> thank you, Susie, come on over. Thank you. I'm Terrific. That was really well done. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, well, that was good. fascinating. Oh, and you've disappeared. <laughs> That was fascinating, Susie. Thank you very much. My pleasure. I must admit, that's just made me wish I had have made, uh, paid a little bit more attention during <laughs> science class. Um, we've got lots of questions flowing in for you. So um, let's start with the first one. Do you think that a love for science is something you learned or something that's in your DNA? Oh, gosh. Um, I... Uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I think all... I think there's a bit of love for nature and all of us, right? Yes. Um, for, I guess for me, it was nurtured through my teachers. So I do, it's just an example of how important school teachers are. I had an incredible biology teacher who, who I think nurtured that love. Um, but also somebody who I can't remember gave me a book called The Fireside Book of Deadly Diseases when I was a teenager. And so I think that also really sparked that interest. Um, and then it was nurtured by my parents and my teachers. So I think that it's the, you know, it's the environment, it's how we treat the interests of those around us. I yes. think that helps them to basically fulfill their potential. Is there ever, I've got a son who's a science bug, and I just wondered, is there ever, um, is there an age limit before you start to talk about the ugly in science with children? Oh, uh, the ugly is in... Well, as in the scary, uh, oh. the scary elements. Um, I, well, is it any different to anything else? I mean, t children yeah. are extremely, I mean, they're great. I think things become scarier the older you are if you don't talk about them. So yes. talking about death, talking about disease, these are all important things to do. But there are ways that you can do that um, that don't stigmatise those with... Uh, those with disease and stuff. So I think, you know, it's a disease and death is a, is a part of life. Yes. Um, and so talking about those ugly things, I mean, there are there are other things that I would wish we talked more about that are the things that are not 
ugly, but they make people squeamish. So things like you know sexuality and yes. sex and all of these things are stuff that um, are also really important to talk about. So I, 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 I advocate for the being honest and open from the earliest age possible, uh, giving children the knowledge they need at the time. Yes. Um, and I guess it's the parents have different ideas about what children need, but they'll they can take it all. <laughs> they can, <laughs> they can indeed. How old, how old was your daughter when you guys were making cheese and your toast? Oh, I think she was about maybe <laughs> 10 or so. <laughs> the thing about my daughter is she's obviously done science experiments with me from a very young age. Yes. Um, ironically, she's not really into science. <laughs> she's um, much more into um, arts and English and things. Uh. And that's great. That's, um, but I think she gets a bit frustrated when everyone goes, oh, are you going to be a scientist? And she's like, no. <laughs> she's had her fill. But I'll make cheese. <laughs> um, uh, next question. Uh, we'll go back into lockdown. Uh, will we go back into lockdown given the WHO comments this week? So I think it's really important to say that what the WHO, well, so the WHO didn't make those comments. One of the, somebody who works for the WHO, one of their envoys did. Right. The WHO have been very clear about what their take on lockdown is. So one problem is that people use that word and it means different things in yes. different countries. Um, it's a very, very blunt tool. We know that. Um, and one, I guess one problem with the WHO is that it's their job to give um, advice that's relevant to the world mm. uh, and it's, or, or to give, uh, you know, these are the things that we would like countries to do and then it's kind of up to countries to pick up those tools and say what's appropriate for you, right? Yes. And so it's really clear that um, lockdowns, uh, to use that word, have been used really differently in different countries um, with really different uh, impacts. And so they, the WHO have come out as very um, complementary on New Zealand's approach. You know, yes. We used that blunt tool because we absolutely had to in the beginning. It's a way of very quickly stopping transmission between people and we used it to make sure that we could you know, up our surge capacity in the hospitals and all those kinds of things. Yes. Um, but we've also seen that if you act really fast, if you stop transmission really quickly, you can get back to normal much more quickly, right? The reason we had to go into um, alert level three in Auckland uh, at the, at the um, last cluster is because the rest of us had stopped doing all the other slices of Swiss cheese that we need, right? We had all become complacent. Mm. And so in order to avoid this in the future, we need to be, you know, keeping track of where we're going. Use the app. I mean, it's really yeah. easy to use, you know, um, keeping up with our hand washing. I would still be advising using masks on transport. Just make these things a natural part of what we do. And then if there are any incursions of the virus, we will be much more, uh, you know, we will much more quickly um, stop it. And we do that through going for tests if we have any symptoms. Yes. And the point is that we had stopped doing that. And, it's, and it's, it is our life going forward, at least for the next year. We have to keep that up. The next year. So it will be our fault, I feel like, if we don't do it, right? Yes. Because we all have a role to play in this. Um, and so I've, you know, I've seen people are stopping using the app and various things. It's like, no. We need to keep this up. This is this is our role now. You know, it's the government's role to yes. keep managed isolation and quarantine as tight as it can. Mm. But that doesn't mean that there isn't the potential for it to come through. And you know, we've already had a third outbreak. You might have missed it, um, and that was entirely stopped using contact tracing and isolation testing. But that is the way. That's the way the WHO wants everyone to be doing it. So we've done it already, we've shown we can do it, but it all depends on how quickly you identify a case. And that means going to the, you know, get a test if you have symptoms. Fantastic, it's like, it's on our watch. We yeah. have a responsibility yeah. to step up, all of us. Yeah, and, um, and what we have to remember is that many countries are not doing what's necessary. Yes. And so they put us all at risk. That's, that's the reality of it. Uh, what have you learned about how to counteract misinformation and rumours from your COVID-19 experience? So I guess the really important thing is to, to understand um, that people like me cannot change the minds of people uh, like you. So uh, it's, we are most... Well, you could. Well, <laughs> we are most influenced by the people we trust and we love. Yes. And so actually we are the best um, influence of people in our family. So yes. if you have somebody in your family who is sharing uh, misinformation or disinformation, doesn't know what it is, right. then there are two really important things you can do. So the one is that you can let them understand how social media works and the fact that they may be seeing huge amounts of fake information that they don't realise is fake is because uh, the algorithms are basically giving that them that information. And yes. so they're seeing a very skewed um, 
uh, view of what information is out there. So the one thing you can do is make them aware of that. And the second thing you can do is try and connect to them with their values and understand what it is that is making them believe this stuff in the first place. What is the thing that they're worried about mm. uh, and try and address that and point them to really good bits of information because there is plenty of it out there. This, but this is a hard thing. And what we have, to, I think what everyone has to understand is there are people out there who are deliberately making up you know, and spreading fake information, mm. and they're doing that to push their own agenda. And so if we understand that and we understand how social media works and how we end up seeing all this information, and then we talk to our family about it, I yes. think that's, that's how we counter it. Fabulous. And scary, all at yeah. the same time. Um, a lovely question here. What message would you give young women who are trying to build a science career? Gosh. <laughs> um, it's it's not easy. I mean, it's certainly not easy. Um, yeah, like every career. I mean, we even heard in the panel before, women are disadvantaged, um, and not just women. So you know, um, uh, Maori in New Zealand, it's Maori and Pacifica. So we we know that we all have biases, mm. and we are all socially conditioned to um, to have an idea of what people do, what jobs. Yes, and then society values those jobs in different ways. Um, and what I think the, the fundamental thing we all learnt during lockdown was who was an essential worker. Right. And those essential workers are not paid very much. So, you know, every industry has that. Science is exactly the same. Mm. You know, it, there, are, there is gatekeeping, there is, you know, there, there is all of that bias. Yes. Um, but it, happen, it comes from everybody because that's the way we've been socialised. And so understanding your own biases and then making the change that you can within your environment is the thing we can do. So within science, that's what I'm trying to do. Yes. Um, but we all have to do it. We all have to work really hard at it. You know, one of the things that um, has been quite difficult as somebody who's sort of stepped up to try and help the country understand COVID-19 is huge numbers of people are really, well, maybe it's not huge numbers, but they, they do email me. Um, <laughs> you know, they're really, they're, they just cannot get past my pink hair. Like so for them, the pink is just so unprofessional. It's just, how could I be a scientist? How could I be somebody, how could I even be an expert? And that just goes to the very deep roots we have about what expertise and leadership looks like. Right. You know, and what we can do here in New Zealand is show that, well, maybe it doesn't look like what you thought it looked like, right? Yeah. And when we make those changes within ourselves, that's when we then you know, create an environment where everybody can thrive. Nicely done. Mm. Nicely said. <laughs> uh, how far away is a vaccine? Another great question. Um, <laughs> so I guess the, the important point is there's probably not going to be just one vaccine. Yes. So there are about 100 and something, 60, that are currently in, uh, in some form of testing. Right. 11 of those are in what we call phase three trials, which is the ones that are trying to look at safety um, as well as seeing whether they actually work. Uh, the thing that is... Um, I guess concerning is that this is being done on such a fast time scale that um, we just have to be absolutely sure yes. that what that eva that any vaccines that make it through that are safe to use. Um, and so one of the things, you know, depending on who's getting who's in what trials, you know, some vaccines may not be safe for the people who need them most. Yes. Um, so it's going to be yeah, it's a kind of watch and see. So the government have announced. Um, uh, just a few days ago that they've signed the, their first agreement for a particular vaccine um, that if it so they're saying that it may well even be ready by early next year mm. the really important thing to understand about this vaccine is is it's developed using a technology that's never resulted in a licensed vaccine in humans so it's a right. bit of a <laughs> there's an idea yeah <laughs> and and it's a really good idea mm -hmm. um, and there are similar vaccines that are licensed for use in animals in the veterinary field yes um, but it, it is you know I, I think putting our um, we're not going to even if that one worked and it was early next year there's not going to be enough for everybody and so there are also then going to be questions around who gets the vaccine and that will that will be determined by actually what's the strategy and is it safe for those who you know might have a worse time right. or do we use it to uh, kind of put sort of protect um, vulnerable communities by vaccinating everyone else right so there's all sorts of questions actually even beyond which is the one 
I think the, the thing that I'm most excited about is that New Zealand is part of a global uh, collaboration yes. where every country um, who signs up is putting in money that gives you access to the vaccines that, that, that the collaboration is looking at. And right. there are about 11, I think, that are, that are in, or there, are, there is more than one that they're looking at. Yes. Um, but that allows countries that don't have much money to put a little bit of money in, but they also get vaccines too. And so New Zealand is playing right. its role as a global citizen to say, rather than just making deals with companies, we're actually going to be part of this global initiative that's going to mean that our Pacific neighbours get vaccines, You know, that's going to mean that other countries that couldn't afford to go to the market in the same way again. Yeah. And that's, as again... We're, none of us are safe until we're all safe. And so we need to be, you know, those are the kinds of agreements that I like to see. What a fantastic initiative. And honestly, we could keep talking all day. <laughs> uh, I haven't even scratched the surface of all the questions that are in here, but I will actually echo some of the sentiments. They're all just saying that they love you, oh. that you are trusted, <laughs> and uh, that we really value um, the time and the energy. Oh, you did you. mention to me just before we got on that you wanted a, a, a holiday. So <laughs> you, you really deserve it. I think it. we all need a holiday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you, you deserve it more than me. Uh, so. So uh, very much thank you, Susie.